Hi guys, it's Katya here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today we're gonna be talking about anterior inflows, how to make your anterior bloom, what's the biology behind the blooms and how to collect the pollen. So next to me is my mama crystallina. So let me show you this beautiful plant. This is the latest leaf she has grown and it's absolutely massive. She does have a few more leaves. So this is the one that I've received this plant with and those two both grew in my care as well. As you can see, she has produced an inflorescence. So this is this little thingy here. Okay, so the first topic is how to actually get your anterium to bloom. Anteriums are known to be vigorous bloomers or like they're known to flower a lot once they are mature enough and happy. So mature enough usually means that the plant will need to be two or three years old around somewhere that age and that it has a caterpill. So caterpill is one of the key structures that your anterium needs to produce. So it's officially old enough to produce an inflorescence. If they have a caterpill, it means that the new leaf will be coming out from a caterpill instead of a petiolar sheet. If the plant is juvenile, the new leaves will come from a petiolar sheet and they don't have that... I like to say that a spot has already been used because with mature plants, if they have a caterpill and a petiolar sheet, in every petiolar sheet, an inflorescence can be produced. But if you have a juvenile plant, that petiolar sheet space has already been used for a new leaf growth. Hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of tricky to explain. I'm gonna show you a short video. Hopefully you'll understand better then. So now I'm gonna show you where the inflorescence actually comes out from. So this is my blooming Anderium crystallinum. And if we look at its base, this is what we see. So this is actually a new caterpill. This is where the new leaf will come from. And usually when your anterium has a caterpill, it is mature enough to produce an inflorescence. And then we have a leaf petiole. So this is a leaf petiole that obviously goes to a leaf. So this is what we call a petiolar sheet. This is where an anterium can produce and shoot out an inflow. As you can see, this one in particular is already pregnant and it's gonna be producing another inflorescence, it seems. There is another one on one of the older petioles and this is the leaf where the current inflorescence is coming out. If we look at another example, this is my anterium Bessier AF, which to my surprise is actually producing an inflorescence. So we have our petiole here and you can see there is a little spike here. This is a start of a new inflorescence. This one will probably die off, but just for the sake of learning purposes. And this right here is a new caterpillar. As you can see, it is already pushing out a new leaf. And I'm gonna show you what does not so mature anterior look like. This is actually one of my seedlings, which is super shiny, yes indeed. So let's look at its base. As you can see, the new leaf currently is coming out of the petiolar sheet. So what this means is the plant doesn't have its caterpillar already, so it cannot produce an inflorescence because all the petiolar sheets that you see the previous leaves came out from, so it doesn't have that spot for an inflow yet. But I think with the size it should get a caterpillar pretty soon. So some species are known to bloom earlier than others. So Anterium crystallinum, Magnificum and Forgetii are just a few that are known to bloom quite easy and you don't need to have that big of a plant. But then you have other species which is like Anterium vicii or Anterium regal as well. Those need to be quite big plants and I'm talking like regals, you know, how big they can get and VGIs as well. So it does depend on the species when the plant will flower or how likely is it to flower soon. Another requirement for anteriums to bloom is they need to have a steady amount of nutrients, so you need to feed them well. Anteriums in general are heavy feeders and especially once they start blooming, you will also want to supplement some phosphorus into your fertilizer game because this is one of the nutrients that's really important with plants that are blooming. So my anteriums have osmicote, so osmicote is slow release and they have it mixed in the media and then I feed them with every watering so they get either 
picky juice it's from organic nutrients it's basically for flowering foliage it's meant for mary jane as a lot of good products are and with it i use calmac or the other option is i use trichoderma trichoderma is amazing for root growth do we see the roots one good example and I also supplement it with Calmac. So to better understand the inflorescences, I'm gonna try and shortly explain how everything works. So anthuriums actually have perfect flowers and what that means is on the spadex, this is spadex, they have both female and male flowers. Anthuriums are known to go from female phase and then to male phase just to prevent cross-pollination with the same plant because it's still in their best interest to cross with other specimens or with other species because this is how they make bigger gene diversity. Some anthuriums are known to self-pollinate. I think Anthurium clarinarium is one of the most known ones and I did also somehow self-pollinate my Anthurium Magnificum, but at the time I didn't know that it was pollinated and I cut the inflorescence off, so I could have had Magnificum babies by now. You live, you learn. So let's talk about inflow structures. Inflorescence is held on this thingy. This is what it's called a peduncle. It's equivalent to a petiole if you had a leaf. This is what holds inflow up in the air. It's interesting because Magnificums have quadrupled petioles and they also have quadrupled peduncles. So, fun thing. Then we have a leaf spade, which is this thingy here. This is actually a modified leaf. Its purpose is to basically protect the spadix when it's still emerging and still developing. Some anthuriums were specifically bred for the spathe colors, you know, your basic grandma anthuriums with red blooms. Um, and then it's the spadix, so this is this whole area. This is where the plant actually has female and male flowers present. And this is also where the berries will form. If the inflorescence was pollinated, it will be then called infructescence. Fun thing. Another thing I forgot to mention, the spadex color and size and structure is one of the key features used to identify anthurium. So crystallinums usually have red spadex and red peduncle and red spathe, whereas magnificums, for example, tend to have it in green colors, so green and lime colors. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how does the inflorescence or the spadix actually matures. The inflow will start poking out of the petiolar sheet and then during this time the spadix will be fully covered in spathe, just so it's protected from, I don't know, damage. The peduncle will then tend to extend and grow to its final size. They can grow quite tall actually. It's more than a meter high and it's really funny, it's like they have antennas. And then after the peduncle has fully grown, the spathe will start opening up and the spadix will start poking up and also growing. When the spadix is still maturing, the spathe will be facing upwards like this, but when the spadix has somewhat matured, it will start facing downward. This one is a really weird one. It's really frilly though. I'm gonna show you a picture here. First, the anterior inflorescence will go into a female phase. This is when it will be receptive to the pollen. So if you wanna pollinate your anterior, this is your time to do it. How to spot a female phase? Usually the spadix will start producing little droplets, which are called the stigmatic fluid. It can have a very pleasant fragrance, so it will smell fruity, or it can go to another extreme, which is kind of rotten smell. It depends on anthuriums. So when you do see those sticky droplets, apply a pollen to it. Usually it will start at the bottom of the spadix and then gradually go upwards. And when you are pollinating your anthuriums, it's best to do it early morning or late at night because apparently that's when they are the most receptive. Another thing to know, so the first bloom that Anthurium has produced can skip a female phase or it will have a very minimal stigmatic fluid. I actually had this with mm, this inflow, like it was, I saw stigmatic fluid probably up to here 
and it should go up to the whole spadex. I'm gonna show you my anterior magnificum spadex when it was receptive because that shit was droopy and it wasn't its first inflorescence because it bloomed before at the seller's place. They can skip the face, you can still apply the pollen to the part that you see is receptive and also the whole spadex. It can be receptive, I don't know. If you have a lot of pollen just go and rub the whole thingy. This is my theory and I've been using it so if you have anthurium and it's producing stigmatic fluid what you want to do is to keep it on slightly more moist side because my understanding is if the plant has enough water in its system it's more likely to excrete it through stigmatic fluid. I found that's true because I tested it on my magnificum and it worked. It started producing more stigmatic fluid after I watered it so keep that in mind. That's for the female phase and then after the female phase, usually within a week or less, it will go into a male phase. This is when the male flowers will start maturing and they will start producing pollen. This is currently at the stage we are with this inflorescence. They can produce pollen for actually quite some time, like two weeks. I think, maybe even more. The spadex will also usually change in color during this time. Also another misconception, people think that if anthurium is starting to produce pollen, that the pollination wasn't successful and that's actually untrue. Whether or not the pollination was successful, the inflorescence will go into the male phase, so you can collect the pollen regardless if the pollination was successful or not. If the pollination was successful, the spadex will start to get bumpy and the berries will start to form. The process can take usually up to a few months with some of the classical anthuriums like crystallinum and magnificum, but with anthurium luxuriance per se, it can take even up to a year for berries to fully ripen. During this time, you have to take a good care of your anthurium, feed it heavily, don't skip a watering because it can abort an inflorescence, and you know, just keep it in a very good care. If the inflorescence wasn't pollinated, it will kind of turn yellow and wrinkly, and eventually it will just fall off, and you can cut it and wait for a new one. So this is the inflorescence. As you can see, those white dots are actually the pollen that's being produced. So this plant has already gone through female stage. It has produce the droplets. So when the spadex started producing pollen it started at the base here and then it gradually went over the spadex. As you can see it's almost at the top here. So we're gonna collect it. What you see here is way overdue to be collected already once again and you are gonna need some aluminium foil. I find it's the easiest thing to use to collect the pollen. Some paintbrush, some people also use the fingers, but this is a method that you can use if you have inflorescences that you want to pollinate because then you can directly transfer it to the other inflo. But now I don't want to waste any pollen, so I'll be using this paintbrush. I've used it before, this is why I've stored it. So let's go. What I like to do is to kind of grab the inflo at its base and then make it nice and cozy so the pollen won't escape from it. As you can see, here is a little ridge in here that the pollen can fall into and then you kind of just start and collect it from bottom to the top. Make sure that you don't press too much because you can damage the male flowers. Uh, and we don't want that because as I mentioned, they do continue producing pollen for quite some time. So I think this will be it for now, then you kind of just gently remove it. I have pollinated this inflow, hopefully it was successful, so try to be gentle with it. Now this is everything that we got today, it may not seem much, but this is actually quite some pollen. I'm gonna save it and try to just gather it at one point, so whenever you are pollinating the plants, so you don't have the pollen scattered around the whole area. So this is it, the pollen is kind of centered around here. I'm just gonna pack it. So this is how I pack my pollen. I like to seal the edges just so just so the pollen can escape. And what I also like to do is to label it. Usually I will take a date of when the pollen was collected and then I will also 
put the name of the plant that it was collected from so in this case this crystallinum and then i will also put the size so approximately how much pollen did i collect for this one i'm gonna put an m and i'm gonna show you what an l looks like because the first time i collected the pollen oh man there was a lot of pollen and now we're gonna speak a few words about anterior pollen anterior pollen can be stored in a freezer allegedly up to six months and you can use it whenever you need it so the main thing that will affect the pollen stability and longevity is actually the water so what you want to do is to prevent any condensation or water being spilled on the pollen so if there's water on the pollen it does create perfect conditions for fungus to grow so you can get mold or yeast will grow there and they will just destroy your pollen so this is also why i like to keep every batch of pollen when i collect it in a separate aluminium foil just so if something goes wrong with one batch i still have others and it's not like my whole batch is ruined and recently somebody told me that you can actually leave the pollen to dry which does make sense because water will then evaporate and you will have less water activity in the pollen so what you can probably do i haven't tested it out you can when you collect the pollen you leave the aluminium foil open you put it not in direct sunlight somewhere in a room with normal humidity and just leave it for a few hours so the water can evaporate this can probably also help to maintain the pollen stability for longer. You can try it and let me know if it helps. And you can also save the paintbrush that you've used. You can further then use it to pollinate anteriums with that specific pollen or to collect the pollen from the same plant if it's flowering again. I think this is it for this video. It's probably gonna be a long one. I've been meaning to film it for a very long time ever since my anterior magnificent flowers but that was back in april so hopefully you've enjoyed if you did please give it a like hit that notification button and i guess i will see you next time bye